The Columbus Legacy, the Germans. Pennsylvania Socialists. Reading, in the heart of Pennsylvania Dutch country, is known today as the outlet capital of the state. Eager for bargains, shoppers by the busload pour into the city from all over the East Coast. 50 years ago, Reading's reputation was very different. It was known as a stronghold of the Socialist Party of America. The city elected a socialist mayor, not once, but three times, repeatedly sent socialists to city council, and was the only district in Pennsylvania to send socialists to the state assembly. In 1912, 16% of the city voted for Eugene Debs, the socialist presidential candidate, and one third supported Norman Thomas in 1932. For the first half of the 20th century, Reading socialists were a powerful force in Pennsylvania politics. Socialism's popularity in Reading was something of a paradox. The city was very stable, very conservative, and very homogenous. At least 90% of the city's population was descended from 18th century German immigrants, most of them peasant farmers who had settled in and around Berks County 150 to 200 years earlier. There was very little, if any, poverty and the city boasted the highest percentage of home ownership of any city its size in the country. But Reading was also an industrial city. After the Civil War, it began to draw Pennsylvania German farmers, usually by the age of 13, to its countless mills and factories. Here they made everything from textiles and hats to billets, blooms, cough drops, and cigars. Here, too, they encountered all the insecurities and hazards of working in turn-of-the-century America. Too little pay for too many hours. No protection against unemployment, sickness, death, or old age. The widespread use of child labor. An early response of German-American workers was the formation of trade unions. These were associations of workers with similar skills who sought the improvement of working conditions through regulation of wages and hours and the enforcement of health and safety measures. Influenced by Karl Marx and other German reformers and dissatisfied with the labor records of Democrats and Republicans, in 1877, German-American trade unionists founded the Socialist Labor Party. The party, however, condoned violence, causing many Germans to support the more moderate Socialist Party of America, founded by Eugene Debs in 1897. Mr. Eugene V. Debs, late presidential candidate, Socialist Party, will now address you. Fellow workers and comrades, the Socialist movement is as wide as the world, and its mission is to win the world, the whole world, from animalism and consecrated to humanity. It was the trade unions particularly that uh, brought socialism to Reading. Uh, many of these were actually German-speaking unions in those days, and they were a sort of conduit between the uh, German socialism in general and the working people of Reading. One of the uh, trade unions that was particularly uh, strong in this aspect was uh, the Cigar Workers Union. And the cigar workers uh, spent their days rolling cigars uh, in one big room with many workers there. And there was a tradition that they could talk freely and they carried on political and social debate with each other. And apparently that was the means why many of the uh, uh, cigar workers uh, became uh, activists in the uh, socialist movement. By 1900, Local 236 of the Cigar Workers Union was the largest and most powerful union in Reading. It produced many of the city's most active socialist leaders, including J. Henry Stump, who was elected mayor on the socialist ticket in 1927, 1935, and 1943. Stump began his career as a cigar apprentice at the age of 13, rolling 1,200 cigars a day for six cents a hundred. James Hudson Mauer, the true architect of Reading Socialism, also got his start in the trade unions as a machinist and steamfitter. Sent to work at the age of 10, he 
He resented that he had to give up his schooling to help support his family. In 1910, and again in 1914 and 1916, Maurer was elected to the Pennsylvania State Assembly. The lone socialist, he successfully worked for the passage of Pennsylvania's first workman's compensation bill and for pensions for widows and orphans. He fought for the regulation of child and female labor, the six-day work week, factory inspections, the minimum wage, and the legalization of unions. From 1912 to 1928, he was president of the Pennsylvania Federation of Labor, a position so powerful it made him a broker in national as well as local politics. In 1928 and 1932, he ran as Norman Thomas's running mate on the socialist ticket. In addition to dynamic leadership and a solid base in the trade unions, Reading socialists succeeded because they were highly organized. Using teams of party faithful known as the Flying Squadron, they could hand deliver campaign literature and the Reading Labor Advocate, the city's socialist newspaper, to every one of Reading's 28,000 households in less than one hour on Sunday mornings. They renovated an old factory in downtown Reading for use as party headquarters. Called the Labor Lyceum, the building's very presence gave the socialists a symbolic significance that was not lost on the city's residents. Since the socialists supported women's suffrage, they actively recruited women as full party members. They encouraged camaraderie by sponsoring everything from lectures and book discussions to parties and picnics. Finally, the socialists succeeded in Reading because they appealed to the basic conservatism of their Pennsylvania German constituents. They avoided anything abstract or ideological, exploiting local, not national issues. They stuck to workers' concerns, minimum wages for workers, pensions for widows and the elderly, and factory inspections. Well, uh, Reading's form of socialism was always a more moderate type. And I suppose it's a kind of compromise between uh, the class conflict kind of thing you expect from socialism and the more conservative sort of uh, community-oriented culture uh, which uh, most people in Reading uh, had. Uh, they never advocated uh, violence or revolutionary action. Uh, they always adhered to the more moderate wing of the Socialist Party. This was the Social Democratic Party. And they never uh, undertook goals like the traditional socialist one of uh, public ownership of the means of production. Socialists in Reading promised good, clean government without corruption, and they always delivered on their promises. As James Maurer said in It Can Be Done, his autobiography, Of course, socialists in control of a single city cannot establish socialism there while the rest of the state and the nation remains capitalist. It cannot do much more than give a clean, honest, efficient, humane administration, free from graft, thereby proving that workers are not all hands and no brains, as exploiters of labor would have the world believe. To do that is worthwhile. A copy of the program you've just seen can be purchased through Penn State Media Sales at mediasales.psu.edu or by calling 800-770-2111.